have extreme difficulties in the other other resources on campus to help people deal with that. And if I think there was three months I want in the last in the case near other fields for the five Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce this email. Can you hear if I say anything? I can stand all that. Can you hear me okay? What if I just stand a little bit? something up. Is that any better? Okay, I can stand here. That's not a big deal. I have it right here. Okay, well, nice to see everybody. Thank you, Alan. I won't tell anyone any stories about you <laughs> from our days back then. Um, so hopefully I can tell you about how to transition from where you are now in academia where you're headed um, to industry and not immediately regret every choice that you've made along the way. So I thought I'd start and tell you a little bit about how I got to where I'm going. So this picture is fourth grade Kristen. And in fourth grade, I won the science fair. It was really exciting. And my experiment was on bananas. And does a banana ripen faster in the refrigerator or on the counter? Perfect fourth grade experiment. And if you fast forward, 20 something years, I'm literally doing the same experiment in industry. Do flowers the nest faster in this situation or that situation? It was the same hormones that a banana really do that now I was testing the flowers. So I came full circle from fourth grade to a big girl job eventually. Okay, so I thought we could go through just how I got to where I'm going. Um, and then go through like what I did as a postdoc, what I did, how I got to industry, what I did day to day, and the things that helped me along the way. Um, so I went to Clemson for my bachelor's and my master's as you know, study microbiology. From there, I came to USC and went for Allen. And then I went back to Clemson to do a postdoc to talk about do you need a postdoc for this to work in industry? Um, and then after my postdoc, I went on to work at a company called Smithers Oasis. And Smithers Oasis makes those little bricks of green foam that you put on. It's when you get a floral arrangement that polymer, um, that's what they're known for. I worked for the division called Floral Life, which makes those little packets of flower paper that come attached to your bouquet of products. Um, they also made a lot of other products, but that's the only one that people know because that's the only one sold in some or not even so, it's just given to you <laughs> bouquet of flowers. Um, but anyway, let's talk about the beginning. So I finished school here, and then, Alan, you didn't quite remember, but you were the one that guided me to my postdoc at Clemson. So Alan ran into my prior advisor from Clemson and said, Clemson's graduating, I guess you said that. <laughs> and so my prior advisor called me and said, I have a postdoc available, would you like it? And I said, yes. So that was the extent of my research and um, like the job interview process to get the postdoc. So hindsight number one, maybe do more like more research on where you want to do a postdoc. Um, but the postdoc was funded by a private company, and the plan was to study a three to five year project. We were going to look at the soil microbiome um, of these fields we had in Clemson and fields at the Clemson Extensions, and they were going to look at sustainable hardwoods. So the goal was grow a tree as fast as we can, cut it down and turn it into fuel. So we wanted to know what was happening in the soil. Um, our part of the project was the soil microbiome. There was another engineering group that was gonna deal with the whole weather systems and all of that data fluctuated and influenced the hardwoods. And there was a third group that I just blanked on what they were doing. 
Anyway, we went about three or four months and the company went bankrupt and the postdoc got mixed. So I was three months into a postdoc with zero data because it was a private company. So we took all their data back and they said, see you later. Like we had no choice but to move on. Um, so in hindsight, I didn't actually do a full postdoc. There was no papers to publish. There was very little data to even work with. Um, it wasn't great. But I think in this, I only had a few months with this one lab, and then I moved to another lab because they just needed some help managing their students, managing what was going on. Um, and it gave me some time to figure out what I was going to do. I just needed to job for a little bit. So I moved into another lab, and within, you know, right away, you just jump in and do what you need to do. But I think I learned a lot as a postdoc. It wasn't really a true postdoc because of how it ended. But, um, all these things that I ended up having to do day to day were things that were really important once I got into industry. And in hindsight, I can look back and say, oh, all these things helped me. At the time, I was just like, I just need to go to work and figure out what to do. Um, but in both the labs that I worked in, I was responsible for just the day to day things of like doing your inventory, just the kind of things that you guys probably do all the time. Um, keep up with the instruments and keep up with all the the work and regulations and things. I also was, which I didn't ex expect this, but I was responsible for a lot of students. Um, I had high school students who were very young and they were in the lab with us, so they needed a lot of work for them. They could never ever be left alone. Um, we had undergrads that were much more self sufficient, but they were at every stage. We would have freshmen who needed a lot of help to the seniors who were ready to move on. So, these things helped me learn project product project management of every stage of this assignment. So from our youngest high school kids to our grad students that were completely independent. They didn't really need, need me for anything except I need my supplies, I need this rather the lab management things. Um, also as a postdoc, I was able to audit a lot of courses. So during this time, the point of my postdoc before it went bankrupt, was that we'd be doing a lot of bioinformatics. And we had those resources at Clemson. So I was going to take the classes to get up to speed with what was going on. Um, so I still did. I was able to audit courses and learn these new skills. I was frequently going to guest lecture when a professor was out. I just would help out and teach a lecture here and there. Um, and then it seemed like my very last responsibility after all these things was to actually do research because it got mixed. There wasn't a lot of research to do. So during this time, it was basically search for a job and maintain what was going on in the lab. Um, because I knew I didn't have funding, so I couldn't establish a long project. Um, it, so my, my choices at the, mo the time were go find your funding and decide if you want to stay in the labs or go find a job and move on to the next part. And I feel like at this point, I knew like. This was not for me. I was not happy in the labs. I didn't want high school kids. I just, I wasn't ready for all that. Or interested in, I wanted to just go to work and go home and be done with it. So I found a job in, um, in Walterboro, which is way out in South Carolina. But before we could get to that point, I had to basically change my mindset. Like, how do I prepare myself for an industry job when all I've ever known is academia? It's, it's very different. Um, so these things are things I've all learned in hindsight. At the time, I was just floundering. Like, let me just Google things and let me figure out what to do. But in hindsight, I wish I had known um, to look into the industry I was interested in. And at the time, I didn't know what industry I would head towards. Um, of course, being at Clemson, there's a lot of agriculture horticulture. So a lot of the professors have these resources with big companies or with people outside of academia or with um, professional societies that they can point you in the direction. Um, well, maybe you could start hooking up with someone in the industry as opposed to just moving to the lab. Um, I also learned that recruiters, a lot of industry jobs will utilize recruiters, either their own internal recruiters or a third party recruiter because they don't have time to hire people. So they hire 
somebody to wade through their um, applications and get you to that point. But a lot of the recruiters will also, because they want you to get a job, that's how their job works. They will kind of coach you through it. So I didn't use a recruiter, but in hindsight, I've seen a lot of people with, with a recruiter and they will kind of coach you. Um, this is what you're expecting in your interview. This is what this job will mainly focus on. And then you can have an interview and they'll call you back and say, this is where you went wrong. This is the feedback we got from hiring manager at the company or this and that. Um, and I think a lot of people just don't know that that exists. But um, yeah, I didn't use them, but um, I, my husband just got a new job. I was telling you, he had been bombarded by recruiters. So on LinkedIn, I don't know if LinkedIn is still cool, but if you change your LinkedIn and say, I'm looking for work or I'm looking for a setting, once that setting is turned on, my husband spoke with getting phone calls like every single day from recruiters trying to place people. Um, he's in computer science, so it's a little different, but I know biology is, there are specific biology type recruiters. Um, so I think you just have to Google and just look around for it, but they're definitely out there. Um, the other thing I'll say is like you can find a lot of professional groups, young investigator type groups or early career developments through a lot of times through professors, but a lot of the industry people, um, I felt like when I was at Four Life, all the PhDs, we could not give up the university. Like we really, everyone loves being in school. So we're like, let's just, this person is a consultant for us and we'll reach out to this group. We always had a lot of graduate student interns. So there was an endowment that funded graduate students, but the money for the endowment came from different companies within the horticulture in industry. Um, so there's a lot of groups like that that are looking to connect the students to the industry eventually. Um, honestly, it just takes a lot of Googling. Just <laughs> search what you can to get there. Um, what? So what I also learned in hindsight, again, this is just, learning as I went. But a lot of companies, if you're searching for a job, you're searching through all these, waiting through a lot of different company names, a lot of companies don't have R&D departments. So it was important to find a job. For, for me, I wanted to do research in some, to some extent. Um, but you need to find or at least look for a company that has designated browsers. So, um, I like some of it. Like, I don't know what the name is exactly. A lot of companies will buy a product and resell it. So they won't have, they might have an expert on staff or they might have consulting, but they don't have a research lab that the products or develop the products. It really depends on the industry where the products are made. Um, when I was at Four Life, we made all of our products. So we weren't synthesizing chemicals, we were just mixing the chemicals to make a new product and then that product was sold. But that is not the case for every industry. And you might get hired as a, a clinical or a technical person, but there is no physical research to do. So it can be a surprise once you get into your job. Um, other things I learned in hindsight was that you don't really need a CV. We, I never told anybody about any of the papers that I wrote. No one did. And I was kind of disappointed. I was ready for my interview, like I brushed up on all my papers. I knew the titles, like I knew which title went to which paper, you know, they kind of so on. And um, no one asked me a single question about my research. <laughs> like, I know that I was ready for a defense. And I just thought, like, how do you feel accomplished? <laughs> so it was important from that aspect to enhance my resume. They wanted a CV because they wanted the paper that said, this person is qualified, but no one actually looked at it. They wanted to see my resume and make sure I could manage a lab, I could manage people, a budget, I could speak, I could communicate through this in practice. Um, they just wanted to make sure you're a normal person and that you have all these skills that you guys all have. You can just, right now you're thinking, do I know how to do PCR? It doesn't matter. If you need to learn the class, we'll just teach you how to do it. It was important that I had this background I knew what PCR was, I knew the biochemistry of it, and we could apply that to other things. Um, 
also in the interview, they ask you, do you have any questions? And it's like crickets. Like, I know you've asked me so many questions. I don't know what to ask you. Um, but I went after working with them for a while, I did go sit through other people's interviews. And we always wanted people to just make conversations with us, like, ask me about my day. What do I do every day when I get to work? Or um, ask me who my who the boss would be, like how does the structure of the company work? Things like that are information you can't really search on the website. Also, you can ask, what do you make? So many websites, you apply for a job and the website is so vague. Like, I did not know what floor life made until I was there and we were in the, the plant and I was like, this is a big tank of flowers. I didn't know what to expect. Um, and no one thought it, it was dumb. Like, you, you don't know what we make? Like, I know the gist of what you make, but can you give me specific examples? How are they used? Like, they want to talk to you about what they do. So you can make conversation you, you don't sound dumb, you just sound interested. Um, and the other thing was, I, I tried to look up like everyone, questions for an interview, like, what do I need to know? But really they asked me those 20 questions. Like, how do you handle conflict? How do you manage your time? And I, um, I don't know, I only have like a boring response. <laughs> I remember they, they were like, what do you do if you have a lot of things to do in one day? and just do it. And I was like, okay, great. That's a great answer. <laughs> okay. So I was really stressed because also stressful. And then defending your thesis is stressful. And I go into this interview and they're like, hey, one sandwich? Like, do you want to talk about how you manage a conflict? And I'm like, you just, just be honest. And they're just, that's the answer. So don't worry too much. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful, but but the thing was, they saw what I couldn't tell at the moment because I was in the moment. So they're like, this person or other people that we've interviewed have been through grad school and college. They were an adult, hopefully by that point. Um, they have a lot of skills that you probably just don't realize you have these skills. And if you're thinking about what aspect of industry do I want to go into, what type of jobs do I want to search for, like literally type in, like technical writing job. Like if that's what you really like, like you can hone in on a skill and then kind of work your way backwards um, to a job, like a job board. Um, so when I was thinking, how do I make my resume look? Look like I'm a professional, like an industry professional and not just in school. I was like, well, what are my favorite things to do? I have skills in writing, I can communicate, I can work on a team in the industry. It's, Everyone is on a team. They don't care who you are or what you can do. If your team doesn't accomplish it, then no one accomplishes it. That you're in it. Um, I learned that if you are an expert in anything with computer, they want you to come help them. <laughs> if you can run a statistical program, that is a great skill. Um, if you can code or program, and those kind of niche skills are really important because the industry is a huge range people with a huge range of ages. So I was, you know, working, I was the youngest person. And it came down to like, can you help me with my PowerPoint slides? Sometimes we needed that support. But also we need to run all the statistics on this project. And here's a program, figure it out. Like, so if you have the statistical skills, coding skills, those were really big things. Um, or if you can run a certain instrument. Like I think when I was interviewing at Borlai, if I told them I could build a GC, they would have hired me on the project. Because the GC is always broken. <laughs> if I could have fixed that, they would have been like, we'll figure out the rest later. So don't, just don't forget like the little things that you know that maybe don't seem relevant every single day. It's just something repetitive that you do. So they're always very important to accomplishing what a team needs to do in the industry. Does. Am I making any sense? Okay. Okay, so I thought it'd be helpful to talk about my specific job. Um, I know it's kind of niche in the floral industry, like flowers and ornamental plants, but obviously it's what my experience was. And it's a good way to go through the steps of it, not the steps, but like each section of work I was responsible for. Um, I think this is probably applicable to a lot of industry jobs. 
just whatever the field may be. Um, so I worked in the floral industry and essentially it goes from the farm to the table, for lack of better words. Um, but each step along the way has research that needs to be done. It has products that serve it. Um, it has each, each of these steps is a different market that has a whole different group of people working for it. Um, and Floral Life and Smithers Oasis tried to target the whole thing. So we had products that would cover you from the grower when you cut down, cut a flower to basically packing it, shipping it, refrigerating it, getting it to a grocery store or a florist and then putting it on the table. Um, so my job description or responsibilities <laughs> were primarily research and development. I did very little research. I did a lot of development, a little bit of customer service, um, which is entertaining, and then a lot of communication and a lot of travel. That's something to look out for. When I was interviewing, they said, you'll do maximum 10% travel, which is kind of an arbitrary way to measure travel. I literally traveled every other week. I would be in the airport and be like, I don't really know where I am today. <laughs> like look at the signs and figure out where we were traveling to. So that was a big part of it that I wasn't expecting. Um, but our research was fairly straightforward. Flowers, you put them in water. Like, so we made the products that would go in the water. Um, they're mostly up to products. So I was responsible for just like day-to-day -day lab work, um, maintaining the experiments. We did a lot of flower experiments, obviously. We would get tons and tons of flowers of every variety and we would test all our products. Um, we were making products for growers, like the farmer would use them in his field. He would put flowers literally in a bucket or something. Um, we made a lot of dip products that were pesticide based. Like they would be spraying the flowers or dipping, and flipping them upside down and dipping them. Um, because there's a lot of bugs on flowers and a lot of bacteria and fungus. Um, so that was like the tiny bit of microbiology I ever had to do, even though that was the primary reason that I was hired. Um, so I maintained all of our cultures, which was just streaking things and putting them in the fridge for later. Um, but Floral Life is a very small company. So I was the microbiologist. Someone else was the horticulturist. Someone was the polymer chemist. Like we literally had one of everyone and we all just worked together. So there wasn't a lot of redundancy. So everyone had to do what they were good at. So when I showed up, they are like, you need to buy some microscope and maintain our cultures. And those are fun things to do. And then we'll learn all the other stuff as we go. I, yeah, I was responsible for the milk scope. It was like my baby. They let me purchase my own milk scope, so I got to pick it out and it got delivered and they would not let me take it with me when I left though. Um, but it was fun. And then we were also responsible for quality control, which can be a job in itself. But for us, we do not have a quality control for quality assurance person. Um, actually, I think they do now. I'm not sure. But I'm pretty sure that they have a person now. But essentially, we dealt with all chemicals, powders and liquids. So we get new chemicals and they all had to be checked for quality control. And then after they were mixed into finished products, we would check them again. Just to keep up with all of our products. So the biggest part of my job was product development. Obviously, companies are profit driven. You have to sell your products. So although I didn't get a lot of time to do it because there's a lot of other things to do, my main projects or main uh, goal was to build new products. So I was on the grower end of this, the big spectrum of growing flowers. I worked a lot with the growers. Um, so essentially we would figure out what their problem is. What do we need? What does the market look like this year? Like high dangers are always popular and high dangers die pretty quickly if you don't keep them. Um, and we are, Customers were all in South America. That's where the majority of flowers are grown, either in Colombia area along the equator in South America or in Kenya along the equator in Africa. So I had a lot of flower farm, farms that I worked with in South America, and they have like rolling hills and fields of hydrangeas. And they grown outside, not in a greenhouse. A lot of flowers are grown in greenhouses. Um, but hydrangeas are grown outside under the sun. So they get a lot of 
bugs and rain. And there's a lot touching them. Um, so our goal was to hydrate the hydrangeas. It was a very clever thing. Um, and we did all kinds of things to, I mean, we had a, a basic idea for the product to make, but that isn't really enough to get a product out there. So you have to go through field trials, scale up into production. There's a lot of little pieces. Um, I think this is the part that in the future, the skills that I learned in product development will help me move into my next job. Hopefully. Um, but conducting field trials means coordinating with people in South America. The labs in South America, we have a lab in Colombia. So the lab in Colombia had to build the product that I gave them the ingredients. They had to source the ingredients, put it together, get it out to a farm, test it at a farm. I had to test their products in the US because they were just more new things. We had to figure out how to source in Colombia or in the US and figure out where it would be sold and where the raw materials came from because you can't import and export certain things. There was a lot of little pieces that I learned about managing this global project for one very specific crop. And it was just one product with one crop that consumed like three years. It was a long process. But that, that was what I was hired for, is figure out this product with this project. Um, and it worked out okay. We, we figured it out. We scaled it up in production. Um, my lab here in South Carolina was connected to the factory where the manufacturing aspect of things. So they had like the 20,000 gallon tanks and the, the silo full of sugar. Um, we had powdered sugar and liquid sugar. And so we'd get everything in and mix I mean, the tank was like as big as this room. They would mix the whole thing, you know, hope for the best. I hope this, you know, hope we scaled it up properly and then put it into bottles and sell it. So they, they did all of that in one location in South Carolina uh, or in South America, depending on where it would be sold. Um, so that was just like one little part of working in an industry job. The other big part was communicating. I feel like a lot of my job was, this is Dr. Miller. Listen to what she says. I don't, I don't have anything to say. I'm not a flower expert. I'm learning as we go. But a lot of people valued that you had a PhD or you had this experience from school and this expertise. And so uh, I would just like go meet a farmer. And he's like, this is my problem. I'm like, OK, you have 100 years of generational experience. And you want me to solve your problem? <laughs> Well, we'll just work together. We'll figure it out. But to Flora Life, they could get a phone call. They worked really closely with the growers. They could get a phone call and be like, we're having a crisis. And I was like, that's okay. We'll just we'll send you this person and she'll figure it out. And that was, that satisfied the customer. That a PhD was coming to visit them, even if she didn't know what she was doing. <laughs> um, but we figured out those kind of things. And I had a lot of support. I didn't have a supervisor who had 30 years of experience in horticulture in his own PhD. There was, there was like literally everyone at every age bracket. So everyone had all these experiences and compiled together we could usually figure out what's going on. Um, so a lot of my job was to communicate with the growers um, or the bouquet makers or even the supermarket. What's going on? Why are my flowers down before I can sell them? Um, so we would produce a lot of deliverables, like you could hand out this information, like here's your the best practice to keep your flowers clean, and here's the best practice for um, maintaining your temperature. Like they were like little flyers, so I would end up writing a lot of those. And if you put your face on it with a lab coat, it's a good, like it, it meant something to them. And it was valuable information. I just was, as I'm handing it to them, I was like, this is cool, like you're, you believe what I'm saying, so you have to believe yourself too. Um, but uh, you will find a lot of people just don't like writing or editing or dealing with that part of communicating. So that I don't mind doing that. So that was always my thing. I was always writing the edit, writing up the papers and editing and writing all the internal reports. It's just a lot of writing all the time. The other part of our communication, which is maybe the best part of the industry, is that you have a big budget. Like it's a profit-driven 
certain company, which always for profit is an interesting thing to think about, but you have a budget and every year we would get together and be like, this is what our customers want. This is what the VPs want who own the company and have a big stake in it. And then here's all our ideas. Let's divvy it up, propose all the projects that we can do and then do them. Like, just do it. <laughs> That's what we would say. Um, but if it's not working, we're going to nix it immediately because we can use this budget somehow. So there was always funding. There was, I could get a microscope if I needed it or pipettes, whatever we needed. It wasn't an issue. But if it was the customer changed the line, the VP had a new idea, it was great. Like you cannot get attached to any project you were doing because when the wind changed, everything just changed with it. Which could be frustrating, but also it was just the nature of working in industry when everything is driven by a market. Okay, the other big part of my job was traveling all the time, which I didn't see coming. Um, I was based in Walterboro, which is outside of Charleston, and we had a lab and a manufacturing facility. So I just assumed I'll do my research. Occasionally we have conferences. Um, we had corporate offices in Ohio, so we would go to Ohio occasionally, or we have a lab in Ohio, a lab in Columbia, South America, and then a lab in Kenya, Amsterdam, where the flower market is, and a lab outside of London. So we have a few labs to visit and coordinate all the technical aspects of everybody. Um, our labs in Walterboro and Ohio had the PhD scientists. So that's where the bulk of our research and development was. All of our other labs were technical, I think they called them technical sales people, but they would do a lot of technical work on behalf of a farmer or a grower, like testing out their flowers with products that we could sell. We were just shipping things. So in the long run, I ended up traveling almost every week, every other week, probably, which was not great for the work life balance. I wouldn't even like unpack the suitcases and just like, pick up your dry cleaning and stuff in your bag and move on. But um, so a lot of the travel included auditing a customer facility, which essentially means I'll go to a greenhouse or a supermarket or one time I had to go to a distribution center, like grocery dis distribution, which is an enormous mile long building. So a lot of them are coolers. So the whole building was a cooler. So I would have to go work for a day in four degrees. It's, things like that, you gotta think about like, can you handle working in a cooler all day? The guy I worked with turned completely purple. Like, he was so cold, he was too comfortable. So things like that, I did not think I would have to go. I would end up doing those things. Um, so I probably should ask my questions in the interview. How is the travel going to go? Where do you store flowers? It's in a refrigerator. So you might end up working in the refrigerator with them. Um, but it, it was fun. I got to go to all different kinds of places. These pictures are from a poinsettia greenhouse. And it was like November-ish, I think I went there. So they were getting ready for Christmas. So this was like... I don't know, the, it was like the size of a Walmart, full of points and years. It's, it's beautiful to see the flowers. But I had just started working at Floral Life when I got there and went on this trip. And uh, it was this greenhouse it was in the town that my dad grew up in, in Massachusetts. So I got there and I was like, my dad has four brothers. Did I didn't make any enemies here as I walk into this place and have to like, give them all this advice on handling their flowers and going to the kids and doing it. Like, this is what I'm teaching on the back of my head. Like, I hope my dad didn't take off anybody. <laughs> it, so you have to, the, the traveling made the world get smaller and smaller. I felt like I kept running into people. People knew who I was. Just roll with it, I guess. Um, but I was able to present all the time. We, would, we had these, um, and that's essentially, or like a PowerPoint. And it was like, here's the crop, here's how you look at it. So we would go through presentations and we would teach florists or designers what to do with the crops. Um, as we were visiting all these different places, we would go test other water quality, make sure everything was clean, make sure the temperatures were regulated. We would do all the technical things and then help them with the, the design aspect. Um, but it meant I got to visit 
farms. I got to go to South America and visit. Um, oh, there's a lot of rose. They do roses a lot. A lot of rose farms, the hydrangeas. I got to visit Amsterdam and see the flower market. There's a. I didn't know about this until I went there, but there is a huge flower auction in outside of Amsterdam where they literally roll in. Before COVID, they would roll in carts of flowers, and then you would auction. It was an auction. And they would get shipped out to all different parts of Europe and Russia. It's a really fast paced. It's just like produce, like you have to get in and out because it's going to go bad. So it's a very fast paced industry. Um, but I got to visit those kinds of things, which I didn't know they existed before at this point. So it, it was cool to learn all these new things about a, a new industry. Um, another big part of our job was providing consult. Like we'll, when there was an issue, they'll send someone out. Um, we would do it over the phone a lot, or we would go visit. If we had many customers, we would just go visit. Um, I went to, I can't remember where it was. It was somewhere outside of Amsterdam. And in Holland, they are the experts in growing produce. It is miles of greenhouses. Like, they have so much knowledge and expertise. I didn't know what we kept with us. But we get to this big facility where they're making bouquets. So they're bringing them crops and then assembling them into different bouquets. Like our water is contaminated and we don't know why. Uh, let's you know follow the source and see what's going on. But it's this huge, huge facility. They've been doing this for, for hundreds of years. Like they have so much knowledge. But their tanks were open. They have these big water tanks full of sugar, essentially, because that's all flour food is. And then they just open to the air. And they have these catwalks that will go over them. So people would be like checking the water tank and all the, the fungus and everything from the whole environment was in the water. So it turned out to be an easy fix, but like we walked in and we're like, this place is, it's so fancy. They didn't know what they're doing, but it was just one small fix that we were able to help with. That kind of worked out well. A lot of our travel also was the conferences, continuing education kind of things, which, which was kind of familiar and comfortable as I got to go to a conference just like we did as students and um, as doing my PhD. But there were a few things here and there that were familiar because everyone had come out of grad school. We all worked together, but our day to day was definitely different. This, I wish I had something like to solve to tell you how to fix your work-life balance. But Ellen mentioned that we should talk about this um, because obviously work consumes a lot of you and kind of gets out of control sometimes. Um, and I think in industry, you have to look out for yourself. Like everyone has a different role to play. So two people don't, at least in our group, don't have the same job description. So I didn't know that the person next to me should or shouldn't be doing what he was doing. So if you had the work like to do that, it didn't bother me like, well, you're just doing your job. It's not like you're doing more than you should or being asked to do things that were outside of your realm of responsibilities. Um, so I found that you really just have to stick up for yourself. Like if you need time off, you need to ask for it. When I was working, I was pregnant and I was like, I was like a hundred months pregnant. And I was like, I need to work at home one day a week. I needed to sit down. And they were like, yeah, sure. I didn't ask for this six months ago. <laughs> so I was always, sometimes I was surprised. I'm like, I just need to come in late tomorrow. I have a doctor's appointment. And like, I needed a few things that would make my life easier. And they were like, yeah, do whatever you need to do. Just ask. Like, no one is going to tell you, hey, sit down. Like, hey, take a day off. So you really just had to be your own advocate and stand up for yourself. A couple of things I was saying, I wish I had asked when I was in the interview. And I think looking back, I didn't want to like, show up in an interview and like, have all these demands. Like, who am I to have any demands? Like, we need to work through our interview first. But in hindsight, I wish I had asked explicitly, like, tell me how much I would travel. Tell me upfront what the vacation days are, how does it work, just so I know if I'm going to bring them or lose them. I feel like there was not a lot of communication on the, the life aspect of being an employee. So I just, I maybe didn't know to ask. 
and then I would like my vacation time just expired, but uh, I would have taken an extra day off if I knew I was going to lose that day off. Things like that. Um, it's okay to just ask in an interview in general, or once you get beyond interviews and you start talking to HR, it's okay to just ask those questions. They have it all written down. And they just, it's second nature to them. They don't think, let me tell you all these very finite details about your job. So once again, you just have to ask your own questions. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, I think it would have been important if I had known to ask this, was when I was interviewing, how many employees have turned over? Like, is everyone leaving? Are they miserable working here? Which wasn't the case at all, but um, I know it is the case sometimes for people. So at Four Life, um, Four Life was interesting because it, it was a small company owned by Smithers Oasis. So we had Smithers employees that were like corporate employees, and then we had Four Life employees that worked in the manufacturing side. And they were mostly hourly because um, they worked shifts in manufacturing. But a lot of those people had worked for 30 years. I would, they would always joke that this person came with the building. This person built this, this machine. So there was very little training. So they were very happy with their consistent jobs and they were treated well by the company. It was just a um, So I didn't know that when I was interviewing. But after being there for a while, I learned who had been there for a long time. I would see people come in and leave quickly. And it, a lot of times they were treated poorly, it's, it's usually their own issues or whatever is going on. Um, but also in our research side of things, like my supervisor had been there for like 25 years. So the other PhDs, everyone had been there for at least 10 years ish, more or less. So they were consistent and they enjoyed their job, which isn't to say you need to stay in a job for 10 or 20 years in the, in the industry. It's, it's okay to move around, but they didn't feel the need to. So they were happy with what they were doing, which was a good plus for their company. I don't know if I have anything else. Oh, I do. Okay, so what can you do right now? I think the big thing is joining professional societies. So I can really only talk about agriculture, horticulture, but when I was at Clemson, and I didn't know this when I was at Clemson, but we had several professors that worked with Florida directly. They were making products, they were testing products. Obviously Clemson does a lot of agriculture stuff. Um, so they already had the connections and I just didn't know. I couldn't run over to someone's office and I'm like, hey, what do you think about this company? Do you know of any job openings? And Dr. Scott just told me, hey, you know this person would be interested in the job. So you just have to ask, <laughs> ask around, in Google, like everything, like if you, horticulture is so broad, but if I had gone from horticulture to the endowment, it would have narrowed me down to South Carolina, and then I could have found Florida. Life. And I might've been a little better prepared because I could have talked to people that were, I was at Clemson, they were in the building with me and I just didn't know that they were there. Um, another thing, if I had been a student or as a postdoc, I wish I had more time to learn how to, Write, like write the statistical voting, do, just do something new that would have improved me and made me more interesting, more relatable to whatever we're aiming for. Um, and in school, sometimes you have time for that, sometimes you don't. Um, also, obviously prepare your resume and work with a recruiter and a recruiter can help you do that. But my advice is make your resume just like short and sweet, it doesn't need I obviously have all that available, but they really just want to see all your graduation dates, you finish school, and that you have a few skills like in each section, like completed projects on time, work with other students, teamwork with all of the big ones. So those buzzwords, they seem corny, but that's really what we're looking for. Like, can you explain to me why you have this skill? Okay, that was all we needed. That might actually be the last one. Oh, okay. Actually, I don't work for life anymore. So now I'm just home with the Rugrats because they are very good. So um, a few years ago, my husband got a new job 
and Lorelei was a great job, but I was progressing. I was getting more responsibility, which was great. I was I had a lot of momentum, I felt like, but I was pregnant again, and uh, all my projects were pesticide based. My, my customers were in South America or Kenya, and they were pushing me to start traveling to Kenya. And I was like, how do I avoid traveling to Kenya? Because I didn't want to travel much pregnant. It was early. I was like, I can't touch all these, these pesticides every day. And they were okay with that. They helped me. Um, I could basically get any PPE that I needed, but I still had to do my job and I still had to work with the pesticides. So at the end of the day, I didn't. My, I was able to send them to kids, so probably for the best, to not handle all these pesticides or go to Kenya when we were six months pregnant. So, so I ended up staying home and then almost immediately COVID happened. So it worked out for the best that I was home with the kids. But I think in the long run, all this experience, I mean, it was a short, I was there for like three and a half ish years, um, but I learned a lot really quickly. So I think that experience in a couple of years, whenever I eventually get to go back to work, I can just take on it. And I don't think, hopefully this little blip won't really derail me too much. Um, I think it was a valuable experience. And now I'm going to say little people, so <laughs> there's always that. <laughs> okay, I think that's all I have. Yeah. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Um, all flowers. Yeah. Amsterdam, I mean, Holland is a big country, but they grow everything. Um, a lot of tulips are a big thing, but they grow a lot of other flowers too. And Coral Life has facilities in manufacturing and now. Because that was the source of the And then a lot of the growers have facilities to build their bouquets. So they'll, you can sell flowers by the stem or you can sell them in big bouquets. And that's the so Instagram is like the heart of the floral industry. And then with the, on, the onset of refrigeration in like the, the 90s ish, they uh, improved refrigeration for containers and shipping so that things could be shipped out of South America and out of Kenya, and that's when the other parts of the industry is really good. Outside of the and outside of like the local flower farm. You've probably all seen a picture of the windmill with a beautiful flower. It's very pretty. Um, people have heard of you, the very first stock market, I believe, was in trading with two of the uh, That's where it's to the facility that they do that. Yep. It had a historic, I think if I take a tour, the Sydney Museum, I think I'm going to get to that. But it was a gigantic stuff. And it was like, it was sick and you had to work fast. Yeah. 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 Realize that is it's important how you sell yourself. You know, think, oh, um, I'm a toxicologist. And you can also be an anthropologist, maybe a biological chemist, a marine biologist, and all sorts of other things depending on your technology. Because you have skills that you probably need. That job. You're talking about the game where they, they look very closely at the publications and things like that. But in the industry, there are potential set of skills that they may or may not be able to teach to really sell yourself well to provide them that for them. Pretty confident. Even if you're not sure, <laughs> smile and just you know what you're talking about, even if. You're a little bit nervous, but you don't think you do. You really do. You're the expert in what you've done. So just make them believe that. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
sort of things looking back and she had adopted the learned skills. Definitely probably anything to do with um, like bioinformatics has so much coding in it, but so does it. It's like every aspect that you can think of. You have to figure out a way to code with it. And if you could strengthen your research by being able to be more efficient in your statistical analysis or there's so much data that we collect on, on the flowers of obviously varieties and crops and colors and there's tons of data. So if you can find a way to better handle all your data and be efficient with a computer and coding aspect like that, that would be a huge deal. If you have that mindset and you can do anything, if you can figure out how to code and make it you know, so I don't really know all the good specifics of it. Just use the programs like SAS. Um, it, it was the most simple program. It would be SAS would have been a complicated program when we when I got for it. So if I could have that expertise, that would have been great. But we used a very simple program, which limited our statistical knowledge. Uh, it was not a great program. But if you had the skill to code in R, that would have been more meaningful. You could run a stronger test. Also, if you know a test that you need to run, that would be helpful. The purpose is always for you. We didn't have a statistician. That's not a lot of people can have that. Especially at a small company. So you kind of all figure it out together. Just Google it. Just Google it. <laughs> Uh, I, I just uh, what, what kind of did you finish your job? I was a little bit I knew I didn't want to do 10 years of work. I went out by in my, whatever that time in my life was called. Uh, I was helping with the job search for a new faculty position. But as a six months out of this person, I was nowhere near qualified to apply for. And the people coming in were, they were still moving into postdocs. I honestly just wanted to move one place and stay there. <laughs> and I love science and I love being at school, but I was very disgusted. And the new postdocs, you know, it changes every couple of years. The early faculty you might be at one school and then you move into a position. Later, it's where we end up being. I didn't want that life and it's really, really competitive. So, if you are not in it all the way, then you're going to be a student. And I wanted to stay in South Carolina also. And there's not a ton of jobs um, just for the two years ago. There wasn't a lot of them. Which is why I ended up in the middle of the world. In the middle of my work. Um, but I think that's pretty much the only job I found. So, I love the way I got it. It just worked out. And I think after being in the industry, I realized, oh, this is what I want to do. But at the time, I was like, that's not I knew it's the college that life wasn't. It wasn't. So, so I would have loved to do that, but I just didn't know. Thanks for that. And remember, before Kristen left, she was in my office one day, very polite, and said, I'm not sure I want to do this. <laughs> I remember that. I don't know. It's, do you think it's different from when you were a kid in the to now? I, I was not aware of what was out there mm -hmm. in the industry, and it was also hard to pull things up on the phone. You can Google your job. Yeah. Yeah. But there's not a lot of faculty positions. So you could do 10 years of test off Transition now, or maybe in a few months. And I was 27 or 28. And I was like, I want to have a family now, and I don't want to leave South Carolina. It just kind of seemed like the best way to have a life better life and still be a family. Well, 
thought they were still very competitive in academia. It's really interesting, but if you can sell yourself or pick the right, like the job, let's say, wasn't for a microbiologist. Like I was searching microbiologist jobs and that got me nowhere. So I started searching like environmental science and all these other words and that how I found it. And you just use all the synonyms that you can think of to describe what you do. And then you might find your answer. Yeah, so microbiologist also because that's kind of no yeah, so in industry, I was in the floral industry, but it runs into a lot of the produce industry, grocery, pharmaceutical, personal care products, all of these consumable things that we have. There's scientists behind them. Of course, you know it like in an abstract way, but there are a lot of jobs behind all these things. Out there, you just have to, you kind of have to pick where I want to live, let's look in this area, or what do I want to do? That's just, you know, you kind of have to go one way or the other. Yes, it is hard to rationalize because in academia it's like for the, the good of us all. In for life, it was for the good of your pocket, your checkbook, um, and for the market. So, kind of changing your mindset, doing profit driven research. Wasn't always the most satisfying, but you know, the projects would get mixed. You would get invested, and then it would, things would move on without you. But I don't know if this answers your question. But if you think back to, at least in the floral industry, who is this profiting? Like, if you go to South America or go to Kenya, there's a lot of women cutting flowers. Like, a, one stem of a flower is painless. So it's not a lucrative business, but these flower farms are providing a lot of jobs for the people in their community. So it, the trickle down maybe helps you rationalize that this is, has more value in it than when you see the VPs on vacation, like the profit side of things. Um, you have to kind of just remember that this is benefiting a lot of other people in this big chain of agriculture. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay, we're just about you know, over time. Let's thank Kristen one more time.